It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. We're at MJ BizCon, the Las Vegas Convention Center. I am here with Tim Schlitt of the Palo Santo Fund. What is the Palo Santo Fund, Tim? So Palo Santo Fund is a venture capital fund started about a year and a half ago. And we're focused on investing across the psychedelic ecosystem. So a little bit different from probably a lot of what you're gonna hear today in the cannabis space, really focused on classic psychedelics. So psilocybin, the compound in magic mushrooms, LSD, ibogaine, DMT, ketamine, you name it. Um, Very different class of compounds, very different class of receptor targets, um, but some really early signs of therapeutic efficacy for medical use. So we're really focused on investing across that entire industry. For skeptical investors who saw um, a lot of the early cannabis companies kind of come in and not really produce anything, there's a lot of PR companies. Yes. So what do you say to skeptical investors who want to know about revenue potential um, and the legitimacy of the industry when people like Bruce Linton, who came from Canopy, got into the space and is more known as a public relations expert and not so much of a revenue generator because he did have to write off three billion dollars <laughs> from malinvestment. Yeah. So Dan Bilzerian did too at Ignite. I, I, I know the horror oh story. So yeah. Yeah, we yeah, won't it's even been a go bit to of a blood Ignite. Bath. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what do you say to skeptical investors who want to know that it's a legitimate industry? Yeah, a, a few things. I mean, I think you're seeing some of those same issues in this space of PR machines pumping out press releases, pump up your stock price, and, and that's certainly a landmine that we face in this space. I think what's unique about the psychedelic space relative to cannabis is most of this is biotech. It's not kind of recreational use where you're gonna see early revenue. It's really taking compounds through FDA clinical trials, getting those as approved drugs, and then taking them to market, and you won't see revenue until eight years from now. So in a lot of ways, I will say this, it is very susceptible to narrative when you're not gonna have revenue for quite a few years. So what you really have to look for is the science. If they're preclinical companies looking for good animal data, good receptor binding data, all those sorts of facets, I mean, this is a classic biotech type play. And then once they're in the clinic, once they are in FDA clinical trials, really trying to get a sense of, you know, what data have they generated so far? What are their key endpoints? How are they designing those clinical trials? You can suss out a lot from there. And then I think the big PR push we're seeing in this space is a lot of people will file provisional patents on psychedelic compounds or some method of use around them, and they'll start, you know, they'll start pumping that out and, and getting that into the ether. And provisional patents don't mean a lot until they're granted. Those, you know, a PTO examiner may, may not ultimately grant them, or they may grant them. They could be challenged. So, understanding the prior art out there, understanding are these patents ironclad, I think is another way to kind of suss out the the phonies from the real guys in the space. So those are a few tips. But I think more than anything big thing to keep in mind is this really is the land of biotech. So the way you're evaluating businesses is quite different from classic cannabis, where you're going to see some revenue ramp in the relative near term, some product market fit um, in the relative near term, where that's going to pan out. So much more science oriented, I'd say. So we're talking about potentially disruptive uh, healthcare biotechnology. When you look at the number one drink is coffee. Probably should be water, but it's not. It's coffee. which I find interesting. It's the euphoric, energetic, uplifting effect. Um, Coffee is psychoactive. And a lot of people don't understand that. They they don't want THC because it's psychoactive and and yet they're drinking coffee while they say that. But what I find is microdosing mushrooms gives me the same euphoric, energetic, uplifting effect without the caffeine crash. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, I'm not recreational, but it's not really medicinal. So I'm not talking about PTSD or resetting depression. Yep. I'm just talking about mainstream applications uh, first, and then we could dive into uh, other yep. applications after that. But the mainstream application could be coffee disruption. Would you agree with that? Um, y- you know, to you your, don't have to. Yeah, to your comments on symptoms, yes. I mean, you get a euphoric feeling. From a practical standpoint, probably not. For coffee, for example, yeah, I mean, not? our... Our view is, I think, you look at cannabis, when it started as medical and then went to rec, I mean, that was a 25 year journey looking at California as a case study there. For psychedelics, I think we have a not so fast attitude of the acceptance around recreational use cases, I think is gonna take a lot longer than people expect here. So our focus is really on medicinal use cases. And to put that into perspective, the way we see these rolling out, at least initially, is macrodose experiences. So 
like a better way to put it, tripping balls, <laughs> as, as people term it, under the guided supervision of a therapist, so a trained therapist, and we've seen really strong therapeutic outcomes coming out of that. So, so it's really- is, Are you talking about like the ayahuasca experience? Kind of like the, that, and same with magic mushrooms, for Right, example, so if I take or, like three and a half grams of mushrooms, I'm yeah. gonna need somebody to guide me through that trip. Yeah, and keep in mind, what you're usually ingesting is not magic mushrooms, like the actual mushroom product, it's usually psilocybin, chemically synthesized psilocybin, which is the natural, that's kind of the naturally occurring psychoactive compound. So this is there. like a GMO? Um, more like GMP, I would say. Okay. So GMP grade pharmaceuticals, think like you're going, you know, when you get a pill, when you go to the pharmacy and you get a medical product, you want it to be consistent uh -huh. every single time. And almost every single medical product is chemically synthesized in some way, because you can get purity and show the FDA, we know what we're giving patients every single time. So it's more like that. I mean, you're gonna get your psilocybin in a pill form, um, you'll ingest it. You know, it would be the equivalent of three and a half grams of you know, mushroom matter, but here it's more like 25 milligrams of actually psilocybin. That's all you need for it to be psychoactive. You take a pill, you have a five to six hour session with a therapist, and more often than not, we see people cured of depression, PTSD symptoms, um, there's a lot of use cases around addiction as well. I mean, the range of mood disorders and addiction disorders this can address is pretty remarkable so far. So, the What is the deal flow that you're seeing in the psychedelic space then? I assume you guys are already investing at Palo Santo yeah. Fund with can or with uh, psychedelics. Yeah. What, is, what does that look like? The valuations, are they reasonable? Um, what... Uh, like, how do you look at that? Is it, yeah. is it, um, are you doing 10X of revenue? Are you doing EBITDA? Uh, is it, because uh, none of these are really publicly traded unless they're OTC, so you can't do uh, earnings per share or, or any other uh, yeah. valuation. Uh, what is your due diligence? Yeah, so I mean, for the publicly, there are a few publicly traded ones, and not just in Canada. So a tie is publicly listed on the NASDAQ. Um, Compass Pathways also publicly listed, GH Research. So. It, this is a bit of a digression, but an interesting thing about this space is from a legal standpoint, completely above board if you have a DEA license. Think like what GW Pharma did, for example. So completely above board. You can list in the states. You can go through normal banking channels. Um, so some of these are publicly traded. Now, with that said, to your point, they're not revenue generating. I mean, the latest stage one we have is in phase two clinical trials with Compass Pathways. So you're still three to four years out from profitability. So usually the way we evaluate these is you try to get a sense of what peak sales are for your target population. So you look at a target patient population, you'll get a revenue ramp once these come to, come to market, and you can discount those cash flows back. So one way to do this is DCF. A lot of what we'll also look at, quite frankly, is comps as well. So Palo Santo, we have a very broad comps database where we can look at different companies depending on their phase of development, target indication size, and get a loose sense of, okay, what is the market willing to bear for a price on these companies in terms of a market cap or a pre-money valuation in the case of you know privately private companies that we're investing in. So a lot of it we are looking at comps. We try to comp this out to standard neuroci comps that you'd see in the biotech space because we want to view these as really no different from those. But that's typically how we try to triangulate valuation between both a comp set as well as you can do some DCF based valuations around these. Let me well. push back a little bit on your timing. You think you you mentioned that you thought this was going to take a little bit of time. Yeah. But do you think that maybe CBD was the gateway for psychedelics? That we've already been through this and it's going to be accepted that much easier because uh, cannabis has got a massive approval rating. It's already out there. Yeah. And it just seems like psychedelics are on the tail end of that acceptance without any hesitation at all. Yeah. Um, so I would think that that would be a lot easier for the regulators and everyone to accept it because it almost has... Um, you're not Schedule 1, so it doesn't have to be removed from, from a schedule. Yeah, well, they are Schedule 1. Still. Mushrooms are? Mushrooms are Schedule 1. Okay, Those are that. Schedule okay. 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same LSD. Okay, so know, it's in the same boat as cannabis, so you're going through yeah. the same rigmarole with regulators. Yeah. But won't it be quicker as a result? Comparing um, states that have gone onboarded, you, you said it took 25 years in California. Yeah. But then when uh, New Jersey started uh, from start to finish, was really, really fast. The dominoes fell sooner. Really I, I agree, so I don't are think they it'll not be 25 learning from years. the experience and will it not happen quicker as a result? Maybe, I don't think it'll be 25 years. I think could it be five to 10 years? Yes, I still think it's gonna take quite a bit of time. I mean, you look at the Netherlands where mushrooms are legal. 
right for a long time. Any form of truffles, you know, the fruiting bodies that was all legal. And they did have a tragic incident of someone who jumped off a bridge. They did it in a re recreational context. It was a pretty tragic incident. And the Netherlands actually curtailed the fruiting bodies. You can still ingest truffles there. But that's an example where you had an opening and then we scaled back. So I mean, these are pretty potently psychoactive. I'm not even sure that we want people kind of roaming the streets doing, you know, macro doses of magic mushrooms without medical supervision. So I think they're just, with cannabis, the risk profile is so much less with that, even when it's psychoactive. I mean, not nearly the level of psychoactivity here where you think you could fly or some people think they're Jesus when they're tripping. Um, not to, not to you know, diminish the therapeutic benefit, but when you're tripping, that's, that's what's going on. Yeah, we're talking if rec we're, versus medical. We're talking rec here now. So that's where I say not so fast. But on the medical route, I mean, I think the best analogy would be Epidiolex. What you saw GW Pharma do there, or some other examples are Marinol, um, Syndros as well, which were THC analogs, which were advanced in a medical context. The beauty of this is when you take a drug through FDA clinical trials, even if it's a scheduled compound, when you get FDA approval, by default, you're no longer Schedule One. The DEA has to reschedule you to some lower scheduling since there's a known medical use case. So there's kind of a Trojan horse strategy here with a lot of psychedelics. That if you take these through clinical trials, get approval, by default, you're, you have kind of de facto federal legalization. Now it's within a prescription model. You have what's called a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy around these. But nonetheless, you know, you can go through normal banking channels. These can be prescribed by doctors legally as long as you obey protocols. And it, you don't go through all the state by state, you know, regulations, kind of the, the hairiness you had to deal with in cannabis in a lot of ways. So in some ways, the regulatory path would be like in a lot of ways with psychedelics relative to cannabis in that regard. And I think that you could see the dominoes falling pretty quickly through that medicalized model. And when I say medicalized also, not like medical cannabis where you go get a card, kind of true FDA approval, doctor prescription at a federal level, not at a state level. When the industry matures, what is it going to look like? Is it going to be an ingredient like sugar and salt where you have manufacturers of you know, the ingredients? Or is it going to be a, a Pfizer, you know, kind of big pharma companies that own it? Um, Marinol is not a substitute, by the way. We need better things because people who have multiple sclerosis or, or uh, any symptom that they need cannabinoids, Marinol just makes them fall asleep and, and doesn't do anything uh, for the patients. Yeah. Um, so we need, just synthesizing something and, and claiming that it's a substitute is not good enough. It yeah. needs to be as close to the derivative of the organic uh, plant or, or whatever as possible. Yeah. Um, but what will the industry look like when, when we get to that maturity? Is it going to be an ingredient uh, where they're just selling salt? Or is it going to be a brand that has like really exclusivity and, and tight control with the government? Yeah. What's it going to look like? Yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing debate in the space. I think there's some that speak to the entourage effect, and that's the same argument we've heard in cannabis sometimes. Of it's an entourage of a variety of compounds, you know, in, in you know, in these plants, and that's what explains the therapeutic benefit. Benefit. Others would argue it's really the active compound. For example, psilocybin. It really that's what really explains it. And baocystin, aragonacin, all these other entourage compounds. There's not a lot of evidence they do much, but we're still elucidating that. My hunch is at least, you know, the first shoe to drop is going to be these hyper pure kind of salt polymorph forms of these where you know exactly what you're getting. There isn't kind of a cascade of different compounds in a formulation. And that's for a few reasons. I mean, one, easier to, to chemically synthesize that and, and, you know, and get more precision around that for patients. Two, the FDA likes that also. Regulators like to see isolated variables when you're taking a drug through clinical trials. Um, so they really like, you know, they like isolating those factors and not complicating it. And when you have an entourage type compound, usually you have to run multi-way trials then with the FDA and they can get incredibly expensive. So for a phase two trial, that's already, already gonna cost 40 to $60 million. If you have to do that for every isolated compound, then your combo product, that gets incredibly expensive. Now the FDA has botanical guidelines, which some people have started to talk about more recently. We have yet to see how that shakes out. I mean, that's kind of a more nascent field and tough to see how they respond to it. I mean, I think you're still gonna have to have pretty hyper pure forms of whatever you distill there. And that's a little more of a gray area in terms of how we navigate that versus these purified kind of to your point, salt forms of these, that regulatory pathway again is a lot clearer. So I think that'll be the initial shoe to drop 
and maybe you'll see some of these botanicals emerge in the future, but the science isn't settled there. We don't know the full mechanism of action around this kind of entourage effect. So it's going to take quite a while until we see that come to fruition, I think. So we're halfway through Cannabis Week, day one at MJ BizCon. What is your takeaway? What are you kind of hoping to uh, accomplish here uh, this week or, or at, yeah. this, uh, co at this conference? Um, I think one thing is kind of learn from cannabis in a lot of ways. I mean, you guys have been trailblazers and there's a lot of case studies of what worked. There's a lot of case studies of what didn't work and, and we've kind of seen the peaks and troughs of this cycle a few times. So, I, like I said, I think the best analogy to psychedelics and what we're currently trying to replicate is really what GW Pharma pulled off and that was a pretty big exit in the cannabis space. So that's kind of what we're looking to replicate here. So learn a lot, and, and admittedly, I came out here. I've got a panel on Friday that I'm speaking at. So some of it was to come out to that. And what are you going to be speaking about? Um, we're going to speak. I'll be with Del Potter over at a company called Aya Biosciences, also working with psychedelic compounds. Okay. No doubt, really well. Like him, like him a lot. Very smart scientist. And we're going to speak about the ecosystem, kind of how we see it. Me from an investor's lens, Dell more from an operator's lens, and a biotech executive and, and a pharmacologist and how he thinks about these as a scientist. So it should be a pretty good panel. So kind of came out for that, and, and I think you know there's a lot to pick up on while I'm here. Great. Should be exciting. Where can people find you at? If they're interested in investing in the fund, or if they would like you to invest in the company, or just want yeah. to learn more about you, where are you at? Yeah, go to palosanto.dc, um, P-A-L-O-S-A-N-T-O.dc, and there we have a contact page, you can reach out. Um, we have all of our team bios on there, so I've got my email there, you can certainly reach out, but uh, happy to chat. Perfect. I think with that, we're gonna roll this one up. I wanna thank my guest, Tim Schlitt. He's with the Palo Santo Fund. Tim, thanks yeah. for being with us at The Talking Hedge. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate I'm Josh McKay, this is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out, and check out these other videos that we've got.